Well, we are beginning the new year in a study of Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 4. So let me invite you to take your Bible and find Exodus chapter 3. The Israelites are in bondage. They are slaves in Egypt. There's a law that all of the Hebrew boys are to be killed. God intervenes and supernaturally there's a little infant boy that's rescued of all people by Pharaoh's daughter, that little Hebrew baby. His name is Moses. God has a plan for Moses, and as Moses grows up in the palace of Pharaoh, eating all of the finest of the foods, he's receiving the best of everything, including an education. In fact, for the first several years of his life, who actually influence him, raises him is, in fact, his biological mother. So Moses knows that he is different. In fact, as Moses grows older, he knows that he is to be a leader. In fact, he is to be an advocate for his people that are oppressed. And Moses, when he's about 40 years old and trying to be an advocate for his people, he actually commits murder. He kills an Egyptian that is mistreating one of his people. Moses thinks that he can get away with it. In fact, he hides the the body, but the truth comes out. And the next thing you know that Moses is on the, he's running for his life. Ultimately, Moses winds up on the backside of the wilderness in the desert. He's a failure. That which he knew he was supposed to do he was unable to do. So for the, for the next 40 years, he's in the wilderness. He, he gets married, and he just lives in the desert. He's, in fact, tending. When we find him in Exodus chapter 3, he's tending his father-in-law's flock. In Exodus chapter 3, as Moses is living his life for the last 40 years as, a, as really a failure, We find him about the age of 80 in the wilderness, the backside of nowhere. In fact, if you would, in the honor of the reading of God's word, if you'd stand with me as I begin reading Exodus chapter 3, verse number 1, and Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning and yet it wasn't consumed. Moses said to himself, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had adjusted himself, he turned aside to see God called out to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And then he said to Moses, do not come near, take off the sandals from your feet for the place that you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I I know of their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, well, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? 
And God said, but I will be with you. And this shall be a, this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. But then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, what if they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am am has sent me to you. And God said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you and this my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Before you're seated, your name may not be Moses. My name is not Moses. But today, this year, we're Moses. And the God of Moses is alive and well today. And just as he spoke to Moses and just as he had a plan for Moses, even on the backside of the wilderness, God knows your name and God has a plan for you. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Take out a pencil, take out a pen, something you can mark with. What I want you and I to see today, that the God of Moses is alive and well, and he is at work. He is at work in the life of this church, and he is working in your life, and he has a plan for you. You may be like Moses. You may feel like a failure. You may feel that you are beyond God working in your life. But I want to say to you this morning, God is not done with you, and God has a great plan. But what you must do, in fact, we're going to see together this morning, there are, in fact, what I believe to be three crucial steps that you must take, that I must take, for our church, we must take, in order to step forward in faith into the destiny that God has for us. In this new year, God's working in your life. God has something for you. But there are three steps that you must take in order to experience this plan, this purpose, this destiny. Take your pencil, take your pen. Step number one, me, you, we must say yes to God's calling. We must say yes to to God's calling. We talked a little bit about the calling of God last week. But what I want you to see this morning is back to verse number four in chapter three. When the Lord saw that Moses had adjusted himself, that he had crossed over that ravine, that valley, he had made that adjustment in order to move toward where God was, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. I want you to underline that because I love the fact that God called Moses by name. You see, 40 years had passed. Moses believed that God had forgotten about him, that he was a forever failure, but I love what happens in Exodus chapter three. God comes riding in on what I like to call his second chance train, and he pulls up next to Moses, he toots the horn, Moses, 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 I haven't forgotten about you. Moses, you're not a failure. I know you by name, and I'm not done with you. You see, you may feel like you're on the backside of the desert. You may feel like that there's some things in your life in which you have failed yourself, you have failed others, you have failed God. I want you to know this morning that God has arrived in his second chance train and he is calling you by name. He's not done. He's not finished. As a matter of fact, the plan that he has is not just a plan, but it's a big plan. Because we see that in verse number four, but the next verse I want you to see is we skip down to verse number eight. And God said, I've come down to deliver them, my people, 
out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land. You ought to underline that phrase, good and broad. Moses, I'm not done with you. I have more for you. In fact, the plan that I have is a big plan. It's a very big plan. In fact, it's a good plan and it is a broad plan. And just as this plan that I have is good and it's broad, it's wide open, I'm going to need you to have a wide open space in your life for me. In other words, Moses, the reason you failed is because you tried to do my will your way. You tried to deliver, you tried to be an advocate, you tried to help my people, but you tried to do it in your strength, your way. Moses, the second chance I have for you, you must do it my way. You must open your life. There must be a wide open space for me. Moses, it cannot be your way. It must be my way. See, what you and I need to understand is that in this new year, and that which God has for you, perhaps relationships in your life, maybe your work, maybe your career, maybe your business, maybe your ministry, whatever it is that God has for you, it must be not your way, but his way. His way. See, the problem is, is that God has no limits, but we place limits on him. Pastor, what do you mean? I believe it's Mark chapter six. The Bible says that Jesus travels to his hometown. And the Bible says he has every intention at his hometown to proclaim the good news of the kingdom and to heal many people. But the Bible says toward the end of that account in Nazareth that Jesus could not do any great work there because of their unbelief. God has no limits. God can do anything, but God chooses to limit himself according to our belief or to our unbelief. You see, God wants to do something fresh in our church, but if we don't believe it, it won't happen. God wants to do something magnificent. I believe that God wants to do something good and broad in your life, but listen, if you don't believe it, if you don't trust him, if you don't say yes to him, You'll never experience it. So step number one to experience your destiny and that which God has for you in this new year, step number one is to put your yes on the table. Even if you don't know what God has for you throughout this year, yes. God, I don't know all that you have for me, but God, know this, yes, yes. You're the boss. You're God, I'm not, you're Lord of my life, of my finances, of my family, of my career, of my relationships. You rule and reign. Step number one, say yes to God's calling. Step number two, stop making excuses. Here's what happens. You and I begin to meet with God, we begin to open his word, we begin to pray, or we begin to sense there's a burning bush. We begin to sense that God is calling us towards something, that God has more for us. When that happens, we do what Moses did. Our tendency is to make excuses. And Moses was full of excuses. He had a whole list of excuses. As a matter of fact, let's just kind of walk through these excuses because what you'll see is that his excuses are often our excuses. Excuse number one, I have too many faults. I just have too many faults. Look at chapter number four in verse number 10. But Moses said to the Lord, oh Lord, I'm not eloquent either in the past or since you've spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Lord, you've got the wrong guy. I'm not really comfortable talking in front of a good of, uh, in front of people. I'm just not good at that. I'm kind of clumsy with my, my words. I just, I have too many faults. Often that's what we'll say to the Lord. 
Lord, find someone else because I'm not good at that. Sometimes we as a church that we try to recruit, we try to enlist, hey, would you serve in this area? Hey, would you come join this particular ministry? Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not good with that. I, I don't feel like that's one of, my, one of my strengths. I think it's interesting that God calls Moses to be his spokesman. I was reading a couple of weeks ago that the, one of the top fears among Americans is public speaking. In fact, statistically, more Americans have a greater fear of public speaking than they do even of death. I was thinking about that and how much fun it would be that if I came to one of you after the service today and said, hey, I need you to preach next Sunday. I need you to stand up here next Sunday morning and I need you to speak to a couple of thousand people, including here and those that watch online. I need you to bring the word. Now, statistically, most of you would panic. Most of you would go, oh, no, 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 not me, not me, not me. I mean, that's, that's not my thing. Now, there's a few of you that would say, okay, I'm ready. There's a few things I've been wanting to say. Hey, count me in, Pastor. <laughs> you make me nervous, for the record. You make me very nervous, and you'll probably not be given the opportunity. But don't you find it interesting that God has a tendency to call us to do things that we really can't do in our own strength? That, that's the tendency. I know in, in my life is that he'll call me to do things that, that, that's, that's not my strength so that I, I have to do what? I have to depend on him and his strength. See, what God generally does in this calling out is that he calls us out of our comfort zone so that he gets the credit, he gets the glory, and yet we are strengthened through it. So whatever God is doing in your life, it may be that you would say, well, that's just not my strength or I just have too many faults. That, that, that excuse is not good enough. And so Moses tries a second excuse, and we read second excuse number two. What will people think? What will people say? Look at chapter four in, in verse number one. And then Moses answered, but, 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 but behold, they, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say the Lord did not appear to you. We could just kind of boil this down to Moses saying, in essence, what will people say? What will people think? Now, generally, you and I know that is not a very good excuse because God knows and we know that we really shouldn't care as Christians what people think about us. We really shouldn't care what people say about us. But we do. We do care. We do care what people think. We do care what people say. That's the reason oftentimes we're kind of careful on social media or we're very brave in social media, but not so much in a, in a group of people in which we're face to face. What you and I need to understand is that you, are, you will never really experience, you'll never until you lose the fear of people, you will never really walk in the plan that God has for you until you can take those feelings and those, that anxiety and that uneasiness about what people think or what people say. Listen, it may be your school campus. It may be that you know that if you start living for Christ, truly living for Jesus, it may affect some relationships. What will people say on your school campus? Sir, ma'am, if you truly start living for Christ and taking seriously his words, his commandments, his commission, what will people say where you work? What will people think? Maybe in your home, maybe with your own family, what will they think? What will they say? And it's because of that fear, we don't live the way God calls us to live. But let me just say it again. Until until you lose the fear of people, you'll never really step into the destiny, the plan that God has for you. Excuse number three. 
well, I'm just not spiritual enough. I'm just not, I'm not spiritual enough. Look at chapter three and verse number 11. But Moses said to God, well, who am I? Y'all don't underline that phrase. God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? God, I mean, the last 40 years, I've been here in the wilderness. Who am I to do that? And they're really what Moses is doing here, and oftentimes I think that you and I use this excuse, it's really a, a false humility. God, this really isn't about me. This is about you. God, this is about you and your plan and your holiness. And this is about little old me, and I don't have the ability. I don't have the strength. I'm not spiritual enough. Who am I that you would use me? It's a false humility. Sometimes when we're trying to enlist people at the church, whether for a ministry or a program or something we're trying to do, we'll often hear that, you know, I've not been a Christian long enough or I've not been a church member long enough or you know what, I'm just, who, who am I that you would ask to serve in this particular role? I love what God says to Moses here. Moses, this is not about you, this is about me. This is not about, about, about who you are. This is about who I am, and I am the great I am. This is not about what you are not. This is about who I am. So maybe that God would say to you this morning, as maybe you're trying to be enlisted, or maybe God's nudging you to maybe start a ministry or be involved in ministry, or maybe just step out and really speaking and having gospel conversations. It could be that God is saying to you this morning, this is not about you. This is about me and who I am. Don't focus on what you're not. Focus on what he is. And we just sang, he is the great I am. There's one final excuse that we see in chapter four, verse number 13. But he said, oh Lord, please, send someone else. Please, Lord, just just send someone else. Let someone else do it. Can I put it in just kind of a little bit more of a a modern translation? I just want to sit this one out. If there's one excuse that as a pastor for nearly 30 years of my life, I have heard again and again and again from church members, from Christians, is that, you know what, Pastor, on this one, I'm just gonna sit, I'm just gonna sit this out. Let someone else do it. What we've tried to do as a church is to help you understand that it takes all of us. There's some things that we have done. We have become, as Cottage Hill, we've become a large church. And some people don't like a large church. In fact, sometimes when I visit or when I invite people, they go, well, that's a large church. I don't like a large church. And I generally respond to them by saying, well, you're not going to like heaven then. (laughs) Heaven is one big, ginormous church. So in order to get ready for heaven, you ought to just come to Cottage Hill. It helps prepare you for heaven. One of the things that I love about a large church is that, listen to me, a large church can make a large difference. A large church can make a large impact. And we've seen that as a church. Several years ago, I preached the parable of the, uh, of the Good Samaritan. And I just issued the call that you would just give up your shoes today for a, a ministry locally that needed shoes and literally Hundreds upon hundreds. I think there were about 900 pairs of shoes we collected. We collectively built a house for a single mom with two children who have special needs. We, we built it and gave it to her. A large church can make a large impact. Just last month, we together ministered to about 900 people through our AHEPA units ministry. And it took all of us, our children, our students, our adults, our life groups. So what I'm saying to you is that periodically you and I have an opportunity to see the impact that when we're all in, in fact, 
Every time we do something like this, there are those who say, you know what, Pastor, I really haven't really done much. I really haven't engaged much in the church, but I knew I didn't want to be left out in this ministry, and I experienced such a tremendous joy and blessing. God has, listen to me, church, God has some things for us in the new year. And there are some of you already saying, well, I'm just going to sit this out. Two things that you need to know. Number one, we need you. It's a big church. There's a lot of people. They don't need me. No, we need you, all of you. If we're really going to experience what God has for us in the new year, it will take all of us. Number two, not only, yes, we need you, but number two, if you set this out, you will miss a blessing. You will miss the blessing. Here's what I want you to notice. Chapter four, verse 14, the first part, here's what it says about God. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Moses kept making excuse after excuse after excuse. I'm not spiritual enough. Find somebody else. I have too many faults. And, and the anger of the Lord began to kindle against him. Moses, stop making excuses. Last thing that I want you to see, step number one, say yes to God's calling. Number two, stop making excuses. Number three, surrender your staff. Exodus chapter four, beginning in verse number two, look at it. And the Lord said to him, Moses, what's that in your hand? What's that in my hand? It's my staff. And God said, throw it to the ground, and he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. Amen? Yeah. Next verse, but the Lord said to Moses, put your hand out, catch it by its tail. That's excuse number five, excuse number six, excuse number seven for Alan. Amen? <laughs> Say what, Lord? Lord almost said this one out. So he put out his hand because, listen, Moses knows now. The anger of the Lord is kindled. No more excuses. So Moses takes it by the tail, and instantly it became a staff again. Let me tell you this, and we're doing Close your Bible. Look up here. I love what God does here. He's tired of the excuses. Moses, what are you holding on to? Moses, what is it that you're grasping so tightly? Here's what you need to know. Listen, the staff, it's a symbol of his past, symbol, symbol of his failures. He was supposed to be leading people, but now he's leading sheep. It's a daily reminder of what could have been, what should have been. It's also become kind of a crutch. When he's looking out over the flock, he just kind of leans on it. He's holding tight. Probably one of his only possessions that he has. Moses, what's in your hand? M Moses, what are you holding so tightly to? Maybe God would ask you this morning, look up here. Look at the preacher today. Maybe God would ask you, what are you holding on to? What are you holding on so tightly to? What, what are you trying, hey, what are you trying to control? Is it a relationship? Is it your, your job, your career? What, what is it that you're holding so tightly to? You're trying to control, but control kills and you have to release it. You have to turn it over to me, that which you are holding on to. And it could be a past failure. Turn it over to me. Trust me with it. And so Moses lets it go. It turns into a snake and he tests Moses. Moses, pick it up. And he did. He picked it up and became what looks like the same staff. But it's not. It's not the same staff. It is now 
the staff of God. It is now, and I'll put this in the margin of my Bible, it is now the rod of God. Because here's what Moses does. He takes that staff now and he dips it in the Nile River and it becomes as blood. He raises that staff over the Red Sea and the Red Sea divides. When God's people are in battle, he raises it. And as long as he's holding the staff of God, the mighty staff of God, the people of God are winning. He took that which was of his that he was holding tight to, but when he let it go and he trusted God with it, and when God gave it back, it became something remarkable. It came, it became something that gave glory to God. Listen, when you give something to God and then he gives it back to you, he changes it for his glory and for his purpose and for your good. What are you holding on to today? What do you need to trust him with? Trust him and stop making excuses. Here's what we're gonna do this morning. The invitation is simple. The invitation this morning for you is to declare in 2024, no more excuses. It's also a challenge of whatever you're holding on to tightly that you open your hand and you trust the Lord with it. So here's what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna ask you to bow your head. And here's the invitation. The invitation symbolically for you is to stand up, step out and come to the altar and release unto God that which you are holding so tightly to. We have some of our pastors that are coming and they're, they're placing at the altar, they're, they're placing some little bracelets. The bracelets just have three words on them, no more excuses. Here's what I want to invite you to do. I want to invite you to come to this altar. I want you to lay that ever, that, whatever that is that you're holding so tightly to is to symbolically release it Trust the Lord. Give it over to him. And then we have these bracelets all over the altar. I want you to take one. I want you to take one of the bracelets. I want you to put it on. I want you to wear it as a daily reminder that you're trusting God and you're not making excuses. Listen, your, your chair can become an altar. You can release what you have into the Lord right where you are. I want you to know as you leave today, we're gonna have some bracelets. But here's what I want you to do, listen to carefully. I want you to grab one of these bracelets today. I want you to wear it as a reminder for you daily to trust God, stop making excuses. But here's what may happen. Here's what may happen even today. You may be at a restaurant, you may be out and about, and someone may point at that little bracelet and say, hey, what's that you're wearing? What does that say? And you'll say, well, it says no more excuses. And you may want to tell them about Moses. You might want to tell them about the church. You may want to invite them to church next week. As a matter of fact, here's what I want to tell you to do. Why don't you give that bracelet away? Why don't you give it to them? You come back Wednesday, you come back next Sunday, you get another bracelet. But let's start having some spiritual conversations. And let's be a church that trusts God. Let's be a church that doesn't make excuses. And let's be followers of Christ who daily, obediently trust him. Stand with me as I pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that in these next moments, as husbands and wives, as they come and kneel at this altar and they lay before you their children, as they trust you with their sons and their daughters, I pray for these couples that, that are handing over their marriage to you. I pray for these couples today who have to make some very important decisions but they're gonna seek your guidance and they're gonna trust you. Lord, I pray for others who, Lord, even regarding their finances or their business or whatever it's, it may be, Lord, that th today they're just symbolically, they're just gonna, they're gonna come open-handed. 
There are others of, of those that are here today and those that are listening, dear God, that just, you have something special for them. You're calling them out of their comfort. And I pray that today, Lord, we would just declare to you no more excuses. So Lord, I pray that across this room today, you are honored and pleased as you see believer after believer after believer after believer trust you with their future and declare to you no more excuses. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.